not today. And, and by the way, David, thank you for hating all attorneys. I do as well. Um, I got a law degree and an MBA. I never practice the day. I don't like reading any contracts. So if you work with me, you know, I'm really, uh, I like to stay out of the, um, I like to stay out of the, the details, if that makes sense. So that's why I have good operators who do that for me. Um, today, I'm excited. Uh, we have Ronald Butler here as well. I've I've lovingly called him the uh, lithium ion battery, the Jedi master of lithium ion batteries. I actually did an editorial in Waste 360 two years ago and I accidentally put it out. I would like to say that I did it on purpose, but I accidentally put it out in May and it was May the 4th. And so like the Jedi master, it just exploded, right? No pun intended. Um, and uh, you know, I think the name's starting to stick. He tells me that you know, he gets a lot of heat, but you know, seriously, he'll be talking about the uh, Morris fire last Waste Expo when we were all getting the first time we got away from our houses in a year. Um, you know, there was a huge 200,000 pound lithium ion battery fire that I called Ron and he was like, I'm on my way. So I'm excited to hear about the details. Um, I hope you guys are as well. So to talk about um, today, we're going to talk about fires, right? We're going to talk about, you know, you have the insurance. Insurance is about risk mitigation. Um, what I do is risk mitigation, right? And, you know, it's one of the things that when I got into the industry um, in 2015-16, we had started Fire Rover. Frankly, we had no idea if it was going to work. Um, you know, we, we were just dumb enough, smart enough, you know. Um, you know, we had a, a great uh, team of inventors. Uh, my partner who, one of my partners who has since passed away, um, he developed it. His name is Brad Gladstone. Um, you know, and he, it was, he was sitting at a scrap metal facility and he was doing security kind of always when you're in urban areas, keeping people out. Um, and, you know, it was one of those days, the, uh, you know, happenstance, he was talking to one of the owners who had literally just had a catastrophic loss. And he said, listen, if there's anything I can do, I'd love to help. And he said, next time, put the fire out. And Brad literally left there, called uh, Jeremy, who's another partner, um, and Pete, and they put together uh, the fire rover system, which, you know, we knew it worked, but, you know, knowing something work and works and proving something works takes a lot of time and a lot of learning and a lot of effort. Um, today, I'm happy to say we have 350 locations that we do um, currently. We're in nine of the top 10 waste and recycling companies. We literally just finished our biggest, um, you know, our biggest installation, which was uh, 48 cameras and 27 nozzles on a continuous flow system, and I'll get into that as well. Um, so, you know, it's, it's one of those things in the beginning, you know, I had so many folks from a fire engineering perspective who had been working in waste and recycling for years and nothing against someone who's been working in the same industry for 30 to 40 years, but, you know, they're not going to look at it in a way that I needed to look at it, which was different. Um, you know, and that's where I brought guys like Jim Emerson and Ron Butler and, uh, you know, a bunch of other outside guys to say, you know, what is really going on here and what are we really seeing here? Um, and so, you know, I, I do an annual report, I have a copy of it, I, I have like, you know, a few here, you can get them on um, Amazon, but what, what ended up happening was I started uh, tracking fires because I was at my first paper show and I meet my first customer and I'm like, okay, you know, we got this fire rover system, we're going to save the world, let's go. And I talked to this guy, it was Brent Shows, who was at Advanced Disposal good friend now, but, you know, at the time didn't know me from Adam, and I, I explained our system as poorly as I possibly could because I knew nothing at that point in time. And uh, I go, what do you think of it? He's like, it's good. It's like, why do I need it? And I said, well, because you have fires. And he was like, do I? And I'm like, it was literally public knowledge at Advanced Disposal. It had four major fire, like four catastrophic or two catastrophic and two uh, smaller fires that year. I mean, they're public companies, so everything's public. And he goes, do I? And I'm like, yeah, you do. You had like, it was like three or 4% of your, your top line revenue was affected. And he goes, we'll do my competitors. And again, that's what this all comes down to, right? Is that, sorry, I thought I had the wrong slide, but it really comes down to good operators have fires, bad operators have more fires, right? So, you know, it's one of those things to prove to the industry that we have an inherent risk of fire in what we do is something that, you know, over the last 50 years, there's always been fires. The hazards right now, I mean, and I can get through some of the numbers, but about 50% of the fires that are caused at our waste and recycling facilities are happening because of lithium ion batteries. Um, there's a number of different studies, a number of different surveys that can say that. But what I did was I, I left that show and I was like, I had to prove to Brent that there were fires, that something was going on. And I looked for data everywhere. There was no data. 
Um, so I started just using Google Alerts and doing reported fires in waste and recycling um, in the US and Canada. And that's really what we've gotten here. And again, the first year I'm like baseline. I had no idea what we were even looking at. I had no idea if it made any sense. By the time we got to our second year and our third year, at the same time, there were a ton of lithium ion batteries that were, you know, it was the symptom that we were hearing about. And everyone was starting to blame lithium ion batteries, right? Um, kind of the unknown. So in 2018, we hit a number and I was like, hey guys, it's gonna crash. You know, we're, we're getting like, this is, this is gonna get bad. And it did in 2018, across the globe in Japan and in a lot of countries and including in the US, we had a ton of fires. Um, and the crazy thing is, is that, you know, I assume that now I'm in 350 facilities, right? We're gonna have less fires. Well, for a couple of years, they started to go down. And last year we had more fires than we've ever had. We beat 2018. Um, so the last two months, we've had more fires in January and February of these two months than we've ever had in a two month period since I've been doing this since 2016. So if you're looking at the numbers, um, you know, how does it work that I'm putting fires out? Like I know we've never had a catastrophic loss in an area that we protect, right? So if you're looking at it from a risk mitigation, I know what I know, which is 350 facilities that are out of the four to 6,000 facilities. We don't, you know, there's different numbers from EREF and some others, but really why aren't fires going down when the industry as a whole has really been focused on fire safety, better operations and all the other pieces. And really what it ties to is risk. Um, so again, this is, that's the January numbers just to show you in 2002. I mean, we had more fires in January, February of this year than we've ever had. Um, and we'll get into it. So, so this is the numbers that, you know, when I look at it, my idea was this, even if we have more fires because of the hazards that are inherent in the risk of our system, if I can put out fires, because it's not about whether we have a fire, right? What's important is how do you react and what's the severity of a fire? And so, you know, we've been getting into this across the board. Um, us, you know me, I put out a, a number across the pond, um, you know, but again, the, if you look at, I can, I know that I have a fire and I put them out. In the last year, we put out over a thousand fires at our, at our facilities. And again, we're growing, we're getting more and more of these facilities. So at some point in time, when we're protecting X number, we, like I believe the numbers will start to go down. But the problem is, is that this hazard of lithium ion that, that um, you know, that Ron's gonna get into a little bit more, I mean, it is not going away. It's compounding, it's a hockey stick. So I used to have graphs that would show, but honestly, we all know that lithium ion batteries cause a problem and we all know that there's more and more of them. And I can tell you, if you look at the education programs and the EPR programs and all the different things, all it's, it's minuscule. Um, I think Ron said it was, you know, 5% of lithium ion batteries, or actually Mike Campaign said yesterday, I think it's like 5% of lithium ion batteries actually get recycled properly. Where are the rest going? In landfills, in waste, in recycling, or they're sitting somewhere in your house. How many of you guys have 15 for, like old phones sitting in your home? Um, these all need to be recycled and they all need to be recycled properly. Um, I break out the, the number of fires in, you know, by number, by total. Again, all this is inside my report. So if you feel like reading it, I mean, it's, it's 60 pages, but it doesn't, I mean, it's not that long. Um, you can get a copy of it, just you know, send me an email. I'm happy to give you a card or link in with me um, and we can go through it. But really what we're seeing is, is that you know, paper plastic is, is at 49% of our fires. And I consider paper, plastic, and waste in one. And the reason I do that, and I kind of break out metals and C and D and E scrap, because the difference is, is this, when the consumer has the ability to change their behavior that's really waste recycling and paper, right? The, there's something, there's education that can be done. When you're dealing with scrap metal or C and D, or you're dealing with, you know, e-scrap, you can't really change the behavior of the product coming in. So again, you can do best practices and others, but if a car comes in and it starts getting shredded and, uh, you know, you get in a car accident and, you know, you have one of your, like how many, Jewel cigarettes and other, you know, other products are literally sitting in the seats. You can only clean it so well before you're going to get that in a shredder. It goes into an ASR pile, starts a fire down the road. And again, takes one, right? We're talking billions and billions and billions of these batteries that are out in the market. Um, 
I'm going to get into like showing videos, which is a lot more fun. So I'm kind of moving through this stuff if, if we don't mind. Um, but just to give an idea, my numbers at 367 fires, I multiply that times six as a reasonable assumption, understanding that those 367 fires are typically two alarm, three alarm, four alarm, five alarm, seven alarm, like they're the bigger fires. They're the ones that get reported in the media. I do not use any data of fires that I know outside of when I classify them as that. So if you look at like EREF, you know, they did a, a phase and they're basically saying that with my numbers based on the 215 and 319, I mean, basically that my numbers are down three or 3.4 to 4.3 times from a conservative perspective of how many real fires we're having, how many fires get unreported. It, it happens way more than anyone would think. And it's, it's really a line of your business. And again, having an inherent risk of fire in your industry is fine as long as you can attack it with technology or some other type of uh, best practice. Um, so one of the things that I think is nice, this is what Unomia, they, they did a really big um, report around England and the MRFs and like all the different pieces. And there's two main things that came from this. One, 49% um, of their WTS, which is basically their equivalent of waste paper and plastic, we're at 49%, they're at 49%. Half our fires are happening in the same, in the, you know, in the, in the same type of niche, right? Well, if you look at metal recycling, for some reason, 18% of their fires are in metal recycling. Ours is 36. Now, again, I don't know why or, you know, I mean, I've asked a lot of questions and I've asked a lot of people, but that's one of the things that was kind of glaring to me, which is really, you know, why are we dealing with or we're at 32? So it's almost almost half the amount of fires. And again, it could be reporting, it could be a number of things. So to go quick, right, what's causing these fires? Traditional fire hazards, lithium ion batteries, hot and dry environments. We know that we get more fires during, in Florida during, you know, winter versus summer, um, you know, um, you know, just based on the dryness. Uh, we do like, um, you know, we know during the summer we get a spike. We also know during fourth quarter, we typically get a retail spike. Um, inherent risk, um, sparks and hot works. We see this all the time. We actually sell a, um, a um, encapsulator agent that you can spray and use as a pretreatment for, um, you know, for hot works. Arson happens more often than you would think. And honestly, staffing is, has become, I mean, I just added that, you know, a few months back because, you know, having staffing, less amount of people, less amount of pre-sorting. So you can, you know, the propane tank will sneak through and get into your metering and literally explode or get into your shredders. So, you know, there's just not enough people to do the jobs that we need to do. Um, to really get into the, um, you know, the, um, the, the amount of fires that Unomia got into was really 50% of the fires that they've seen, one out of two, when they really dug into it, um, you know, was, uh, was what we were looking at. So I know I'm moving through some of these quick. All this data is in the annual report. It goes by state. Okay, so consequences. This is more important. Yeah, so in Europe, what they believe the severity of a fire, they believe from the WISH standard that they put out is that if you have a fire in a waste and recycling facility that you've dealt with it and it, you're back to work in four hours, it's considered a successful incident. That's an issue, right? To me, I believe it's 10 minutes, right? And that's really what our solution does that's different. So the, um, if you look at like the length of disruption, because again, it's not about whether you have a fire. You have a small little fire, you put it out, not a problem. You can have thousands of those. Honestly, it's, I mean, it's an issue, but it's not an issue until it's catastrophic. And what's David going to tell us? The minute it's catastrophic, it's over, right? I mean, trying to get insurance these days is very difficult. So really from a risk mitigation is the goal of what we do is to try to bring you back to the days well before lithium ion batteries, whether you're self-insuring or whether you're insuring yourself. But basically, the severity of fires, huge, huge, huge piece. Now, here's costs. In the UK, our equivalent for costs is the, all of the costs of these manufacturers, and this is where I talk about producer responsibility, is that the manufacturers, they put this product out to us, right? We as users want our iPhones to work. We want portable power. We are begging for it, right? So we're saying, give us all these, these different things that we can now run around with. I want it more powerful. I want it better. Well, we got what we want. So the manufacturers aren't doing a bad job. They're actually doing what we need and quenching our thirst for more power, right? 
But the problem is, is the cost to fight them, 90% are falling on the waste and recycling operators, which what that means is that's waste and recycling operators plus the insurance companies. This is why everybody's leaving. The real cost, and again, the rest are the fire professionals, which again, we have Ronald here who's a chief for 30 years in Detroit firefighting. You know, he understands, I, I work with a guy, Andy Stearns, there is not enough training and there is not enough equipment. So what I've been pushing for is, if you're gonna bring money back from the producers, can't focus just on education. We have to focus on education, but we also have to focus on training of our firefighters. We need to focus on making sure that they have the right insurance options. Um, and then we also need to make sure that they have the proper equipment to fight these types of fires, whether it's the operator and or the fire professionals. So the number is 1.2 billion a year in the US, right? We just heard there was a, you know, there were two fires that were probably $70 million worth of damage in last week alone. So again, the 2.5 billion that we're having in fires is a big issue. And it's a big issue for a number of reasons, but the biggest reason it's a big issue is that we now don't have the capacity and we're growing as, a, as an industry or we're growing as a country and it's proper infrastructure. You lose a MRF and now every other MRF is now overloaded and they have more of a fire risk. Um, this is death and injuries. You know, I'll, I'll go through this quickly. I mean, the, the, the sad thing about the injuries is that it's mostly firefighters, right? This is not our employees, which is the good thing, right? But it's mostly the firefighters who are fighting these fires um, and they have the injuries. And then, you know, we have had, uh, we have two deaths a year, right? And, you know, I, I can share those as well. And they're, they're shared in the annual report. Um, just to get into, you know, everyone's saying from an insurance perspective, you know, the, they're leaving the market at a rapid pace. So this was from Nathan Brainerd. This was in 2018 when I was talking about, you know, the wave of lithium ion batteries. It was the first time we really got hit. You can see those are the actual claims data from the top five insurers. Um, and it was shredders, lithium ion batteries had their spike, right? So again, this isn't like we're saying, hey, we have an issue. I mean, it's all proven. Seven years ago when I started doing this, it wasn't. So I was out there really trying to justify my numbers and trying to justify that we were really having a problem. You know, now, I mean, it, it's, it's pretty well documented. So really at the end of the day, the goal is this. And again, this really gets into that insurance piece is, what do we need to do to mitigate our risk? What do you do as an operator? And then what do we have to do as an industry? And so I know David and the good brokers, even though he made fun of lawyers, you know, I'm, I'm gonna say that all brokers are great. Um, that's my story, I'm sticking to it, it's on video. but. Well, you know, the issue is this, it's really about risk mitigation, good operator, you got to be a good operator and you got to have your fire professionals, they have to be well trained, they have to have the right tools. And a lot of that is the communication between you and your fire professional, they're going to feel better coming to your site when they know how to get in, right, when they know how to get in at two in the morning, when they know that you paid for a calf system that's sitting there waiting for them, that you know, they can do two things and, or, or turn two nozzles and start spraying and putting a fire out and it, get, it stops their guys from getting hurt. In lithium ion batteries, we've developed a solution through Fire Rover that we do for some of the automotive OEMs where it's literally a lithium ion battery solution where the firefighters have to take a defensive approach. So we put a quick connect on the back, we spray and then um, right at the end, like the fire department, when they arrive, they can actually connect and we can continuously spray for as long as we need to without the firefighters ever having to walk in the buildings. Um, so the, 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 uh, the Morris fire, we're going to talk about that. We actually cover a couple in that area. Obviously that one, there was a number of reasons why it was, it was not kind of on the up and up, but you know, really the idea again is you need to have solutions where the insurance companies, they can mitigate the portfolio risk where they're not looking just at you, they're looking at the portfolio and saying, why are, I don't want to be in this industry, right? Like I, I can't make any money. And again, that's why they're here. Um, and again, operators can always get something, but it's the question, are they getting the right, you know, the, the right type? So really when we focus on fires, it's prevention versus professional response. And what I was telling you guys before, that internal response is that first 10 minutes. I'm doing everything I can to catch a fire before it starts. And when I do, you know, the idea is like, I can have a fire in incipient and we call it in pre-incipient stage is where I'm, I'm catching preemptive maintenance. I'm catching fires before there's flames in ASR piles. We're catching them in metering drums. We're catching them in a lot of places, but even if it does flame, I want to be able to put it out and eliminate it before you have a catastrophic loss um, and your guys can go back to work. So 
really what, so what we developed is the fire rover solution. If you've never seen it, it's a big red box. Uh, Brad was, you know, like to bring attention to what he was doing, which again, it's good and it's bad. It's good because we're putting fires out, you know, knock on wood. Um, if we don't, there's still a big red box on site. So, um, so basically it's a 20 by eight by eight container. It uses internet and electricity. It's completely self-contained and it's dry. So this thing goes in, in you know, we have it as in Calgary, we have it all the way down in, you know, the desert, we have a number in the deserts. Um, it's heated, it's cooled, and what ends up happening is that, and this is where we'll get to videos, and I'm not gonna say it's the, the greatest videos, but let's see, there we go. Okay, so this is our encapsulator agent that we use. It's an environmentally friendly wetting agent, no PFAS. We, we literally, in 2016, uh, we, we changed to not use a, like any, um, any foams that had PFAS in it. So, I mean, th this is really the, the unit working. And let me, let me kind of walk you through this. Is it gonna play? Success. Oh, no. Uh, oh, it's playing? Yeah, it's playing. Six, success. There we go, it looks like it's moving. No? There it goes. Okay, so, so this is a, a normal tip floor. You see it, we can see through heat, we can see through darkness. There's a fire that actually started in their metering drum and then there's another fire that started over. So what's happening is, is that we see it, the employees evacuate like they should, right? We're, we have a fire rover agent who is in another state. They're in, you know, they're, they're uh, looking at it, they're verifying. Once they see that it's a fire, they call the fire department, they call the guys on site, and then they actually charge the unit and they're using a joystick and they're literally applying our environmentally friendly cooling agent to both those fires. So you'll see, here's like the other angle. We, whenever I say I'm using a camera, typically it's three cameras. We have nozzle cam and we have tr like a depth cam. And again, we're putting this fire out before anything happens, right? The fire department gets there, they arrive on scene, they say, hey, everything's good. These guys go back to work, there's no damage. We do this a thousand times a year. Um, now again, the, the question becomes, and it's getting more and more. I mean, you know, last year we, I mean, we, we've added probably 150 locations in the last 12 months and it'll be, I mean, my gut tells me that we'll probably be at 250 over the next 12 months. Um, this is, uh, you know, let me get you to it like a lithium ion battery. This is a really good example, if I can get it to play. There we go. So this will see the metering drum again, this will actually, if it doesn't cause a fire, we'll shut this down, call the, um, you know, call the, the, um, call the site, and they'll basically take out whatever obstructions inside the metering drum. Okay, so then on two, we also have another camera that's strategically located on the, uh, on the conveyor. If it starts a fire, it shuts down all the conveyors. Um, and then we're literally, as we see that, we come back and then we'll spray these. So, you know, I mean, I can give you a, a ton of these videos, a lot of them are on uh, YouTube. So, you know, this was a hot load that somebody dumped right on. Uh, actually, this was a deep-seated fire. So, I mean, there's a ton of these videos, right? And it, again, the beauty of what we do, we can actually see what, where the fires start. You know, they can get bad quick, I mean, depending. Um, So this right here is lithium ion batteries. So this was accidentally dropped off at one of my customers' location. They dumped half of it onto the tip floor and then they brought it outside. The truck was on fire. Um, you know, and again, this caused probably six, seven fires over a one week period inside my customer's transfer station because they couldn't get these button batteries all up. It, they fell in cracks, they fell everywhere. And again, they kept driving on them. So like, here's a good example of a typical, a lot of these are small fires, right? We catch it, we see it, we spray it, everyone knows about it. You know, I hear all the time that people will say that, you know, we catch these in the middle of the night, um, you know, or that, that there's only fires, you, you know, we have a guy watching during the day. The answer is, um, most of the time these fires happen during the day and a lot of times we catch them where no one sees them. So someone's on lunch, it's a blind, uh, you know, blind, uh, a blind spot. Let me get to, so we, we just, we just developed for landfills um, a product called the OnWatch, which is a, um, let me show you guys that video. So basically it's a trailer that 
Um, I'm going to have at Waste Expo. We're also going to have on site at at at, um, at Isri. And so what it is is it's basically a trailer that is wind powered, solar powered, and it will follow the landfill facing. So it moves and then it's movable. So it works for construction and demolition for wildfires. Um, but it is a uh, there you go. So that unit will have it if, if anyone's going to be at those two shows, we'll have it on site. But you know, we, we piloted it a year ago. It's done really well. We've also done a continuous flow systems um, and lithium ion battery specific, um, you know, uh, operations. And you know, we're doing a refinery, we're doing others. So I think really what's most important to say is that the entire fire industry and you know, Ron can speak for this. It, it, they've really moved from a water, water, water based approach to how do you detect something early and how do you spray it and put it out early and, and deal with it, stop it in its tracks. Having a fire is not acceptable anymore. Um, putting 150,000 you know, tons of water or gallons of water onto a fire, it's not acceptable because of all of the environmental issues, the PFAS issues, everything that goes with it, you need to catch these fires and catch them early. And that's really one of the things that, you know, that we're really doing. And the waste and recycling industry has been on the forefront of this type of technology. Again, we have a patent. We've been blessed by working with everyone. And hopefully we're, you know, we're going to turn the tide and stop having as many fires as we've had. Um, good? Good. Good. Awesome. Got time for a quick question? I've got a quick question. Uh, as the risk of fires uh, directly related to facility size and or type? No. Okay. I mean, you know, I think what, what we're going to see is that, like, you don't, the, the risk is more based on where you get your product from. So I know there's been, there's been some operators that have gone and done education per streets because they're seeing a lot of, like, you know, contamination, whether it's lithium or anything else. And, you know, when they educate those streets, they're actually seeing some positive effects on those. So, you know, it is one of those things that a lot of times it's your area. Sometimes you get like really good recycling. Sometimes you get, you know, really bad depending on where you are. So, you know, again, it, it, it's, I, I don't think based on size and it's important, but I mean, I will say for our customers, we are definitely from a business continuity perspective, we are doing their bigger, we're doing the biggest MERS first, right? Because it's really a revenue question. If I'm getting 3% of my revenue out of one location, I'm protecting that one. Uh, no, it's awesome. Yeah. You guys, I'm looking forward to Ron, so thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, man. All right. All right, our next uh, presentation is a, uh, a case study uh, revisiting the Mars, uh, Illinois battery warehouse fire, addressing mitigation response and business continuity strategies for the recycling industries. And uh, a warm welcome for Ron uh, Jedi Master Butler, the CEO of the Energy Storage Safety Products International. Ron. Thank you. Thank you. And I thought, uh, Ryan, I thought I was a big nerd about this stuff, man. You are a nerd, and, that's a, and that is a good, yes, and that is a good, good thing. Bear with me while I pull this up. Okay. You're the goat. The goat? <laughs> the goat. I don't know about that. Okay. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, I call Ryan a nerd, but we need nerds. The data sets that he brings to bear are absolutely critical for your protection to make sure your businesses stay in business. Uh, we, didn't, we existed for a long time without those data sets, and unless we can go to the numbers and show why we need solutions, uh, services, products and technologies, process, unless we can uh, referred to numbers, no one's going to buy these things. No one's going to protect themselves. Insurance costs go up. And that's where my uh, question to you, David, will ultimately come. Uh, what are your thoughts? I think we can get to this as we move forward in the question and answer. What are your thoughts relative to lithium ion fires in particular? 
and the, and the insurance underwriting pressures that are coming to bear. So if you can give that some consideration, we can come back to it. I appreciate it. But I'm here to talk about a, a specific event. So I'm going to do a little bit of storytelling. I hate podiums. I would rather walk amongst you, but that's not going to be feasible today. Um, we're going to talk about the Morris Battery Fire. How many folks in here heard about the battery warehouse fire that took place in Morris, Illinois last year? It would have been the end of June, beginning of July. Nobody? I see, I see one, two, three. There's a couple people in here. Well, it was a sea change event. And what I mean by that is heads remain in the sand, whether it's automotive OEMs, whether it's their tier suppliers, whether it's recyc recyclers and their ilk. Heads remain in the sand. We avoid the problems as long as we can. Why? Because they can tend to be very expensive. I have to address this. I don't want to pay for new technologies. I don't want to pay to train my employees, very key, training your employees. I don't want to do these things. But this fire in particular showed why we have to. So before I run this video, and, and uh, I'll give you a little bit of background on how this happened. It took place June 29th of, I'm sorry, June 29th of last year. Before that, I'd like to uh, bring to your attention a couple of other events. Now, these happen on a weekly basis. They might happen on a daily basis, but I would challenge the 6X underreporting. I think it's much higher than that. I think that the underreporting, either conscious or otherwise, I don't want to tell the firefighters to come to my facility because when the firefighters come to my facility, others know. When others know, the insurance underwriter knows. When the insurance underwriter knows, what happens to my costs? They go up. So we try to keep it to a minimum. I understand that. But the other thing I would challenge my friend Ryan on is no such thing as a small fire. Small fires turn into what? Big fires. That's always how it happens. It's physics. So we have to make sure that we understand that going in. The image to the far right took place just outside of Detroit. New batteries being shipped from an unidentified Automotive OEM will keep it identified. I'll just give you a hint. The first letter in the company's name is a G, and the second letter in the company's name is an M. That'll give you a little bit of information on who was shipping the batteries. Brand new battery commodity, shipped as it should be, per rule, 30% state of charge. When we say state of charge, how much energy is inside of the battery? So 30% state of charge is acceptable. It's not proven. There's no data really to show that that's why we ship it that way. But it's allowed. Brand new on the, on the freeway during what's called the battery show in Novi, Michigan. You cannot make this stuff up, Ray. We're in the battery show. Someone comes to me. Todd McIntosh from General Motors says, Ron, there's a fire outside. No idea. We all walk outside. We could see the plume of smoke coming from I-275, and it was this vehicle containing brand new modules for EVs. Second, you might have heard about this one a couple of weeks ago, Felicity Ace. It's at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean right now, shipping 4,200, mostly owned by the Volkswagen Group. There again, I threw another company under the bus. Mostly owned by the Volkswagen Group. Shipping electric vehicles with batteries in tow, batteries encased, separating them would have been smart, but we're just now learning those lessons. But the first inclination from lay folk is to say what caused the fire. What do you think? The batteries in the cars. We can't prove that. We'll probably never prove that because it's at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. $500 million, or in other words, half a billion dollars worth of commodity loss, and the ship itself, which is probably about $150 million. It all starts with one battery, which starts from one module, battery, big battery, broken down into modules, broken down into individual components called cells. That's generally what caused more fires, the cell. It all starts with that one cell. The last image is out of Houston, Texas, uh, where they're removing batteries for recycling uh, by rail. The car exploded, broke windows about half a mile away. 
Fortunately, fortunately, no one was hurt in any of these, of these events, but that time is coming too. Here's a video of uh, the Morris. I told you I'd do a little bit of storytelling. So they call me at five o'clock in the morning. Hey, are you Ron Butler? Some guy named you the Jedi Master. You must be a real clown. Yes, I am. I like to have fun. We have a fire in Morris, Illinois, about an hour southeast, southwest, I'm sorry, of Chicago. And it involves a battery warehouse. Can you come out here? We'll send the Illinois State police helicopter to come get you. I'm not getting anyone's helicopter, so I'll drive. About four hours later, I get there. It looks like this. What we did was uh, we ascertained that the building was about 200 by 300 feet, full of batteries, about two, just south of 200 tons. 200 tons, I thought, would be a lot bigger. I've seen Amazon warehouses full of batteries. I've seen General Motors Supply Warehouse, LG Chem, full of batteries. I've seen lots of batteries. 200 tons was not a lot. We saw the, the black and white smoke trending towards gray, means that there's an active fire burn, and that lithium ion was involved. When I got out of my car after the four-hour drive, the first thing I smelled from about three blocks away was juicy fruit. I'm an old guy. Does anybody remember juicy fruit gum? I know the young people in here don't, but juicy fruit gum. That's what it smells like when, this, when lithium ion batteries burn, or lithium. And I'll digress for just a second. Does anybody know the difference between a lithium and a lithium ion battery? Simple. Lithium cannot be recharged and is composed of lithium metal, a class D combustible that you cannot extinguish with water. You can, but I wouldn't advise it. It reacts when you put water on it. Lithium ion, on the other hand, is rechargeable, lithium ion, recharge, and you find that in your laptops, in your cell phones. See, I'm old. I call it a cell phone. It's a mobile device. Those are rechargeable lithium-ion batteries. You treat them differently, and they are different. We arrive on scene. We find that um, they've already started forward fire response operations. We wound up taking a, um, a local police department drone and tasking it to fly through, and I'll show you some video of the inside of the facility in just a moment, to fly through and around the, the, uh, in a, the facility to stage and to get a better sense of how firefighters were gonna go in. Well, we found that firefighters had already been in. They go into the building, they hear popping noises, they hear clicking. There are things flying around. Well, those are the cells. They're shrapnel, because once they heat, they become fireworks. They back out, they being the firefighters. On the way there, they say, Ron, how do we get this fire under control? We just evacuated 16 square miles of neighborhood right before the 4th of July weekend. The, uh, the mayor is up in arms. The state is, is going crazy. EPA is on scene, both federal and local and region five. They're all on scene. USDOT is on scene. The governor is having a hissy fit. How do we get this under control? Well, before I could give them the proper response, they had already dumped what we call uh, Purple K. And I'll show you a video of that just now. So you can see, I'm gonna step away from Mike, but I have a big enough mouth. See the purple stuff? Purple K. It's what we use in aircraft fires, uh, oil refinery fires. They're very good for that purpose. Not so much for this. Didn't work. So what else do we do? Or did they do? Well, they, they sit in right in the middle of the country's largest nuclear plant spread, three nuclear plants. And what they're charged to do if there's a failure in a reactor is cover it with cement, because that encases the radioactive material. So what they do, we don't know what else to do. Let's dump cement on it. What you see here, the, the tan stuff, is a mixture of the burn battery components and Portland cement. I don't blame the fire service because they didn't know what to do. They were trying to figure out what to do. By the time I got there and said, you could have used water, they had already gone through this process. So they set up an emergency response operations center, and this is what can happen. At some point, I'm going to drag all this back to your concerns. 
this is what happens, and this is what Ryan did a really, really good job of getting to. Your risk goes beyond what you think it does. The lithium ion battery or lithium battery in your facility that ignites is just the kindling. It's the beginning. And there's everything else that spreads and destroys your business. Drives up insurance underwriting costs. Potentially injures your people or firefighters. Firefighters did go in. Uh, we did an interview with uh, two of the firefighters that reported some uh, breathing problems afterwards. They're fine now. Uh, we have not started cleanup on this, on this uh, environment just yet. You'll notice um, as we run through this video that on the far, what we call, if, if you're walking into a building, just a little bit of fire service speak, you're walking into the building. The front of the building is what we call the A side. To the left is the B side. To the rear is the C side, so that makes the right what? The D side. Walking into this building, you're looking at the D side. There are materials burned on this side. And as we, we task the drone to fly through, you'll notice that there's lots of unburned material between the D side and the B side. How'd this happen? Because there's burned material on the, a, on the B side and the D side. Well, what we found out, well, the, the first thing they thought is that the, the owner was an irrational player nefarious. He set this uh, on fire himself to collect some insurance. Problem number one, he was not insured. So how do we show that this could have happened naturally? And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what happened to him. Uh, Chinese national uh, uh, citizen doing very good work. Very high quality batteries, by the way. These were not recycled material. These were high quality batteries. So if it happens with those, it can absolutely happen in the recycling environment. So as you see, these are all burned stuff. I agree. Burned stuff on one side of the building, but everything in between is unaffected. How that happened? Well, the fire started on the A side. What we think is what happened is it spread across the roof joists with wiring, plastic wiring, dropped down on the other side and what do you notice about packaging? What stands out about packaging to you? Don't be afraid. It's clean. What about the material? Plastics, what else? I heard, I heard wood over here. Paper and wood, we call those common combustibles. They burn easily. So the material we think burned its way across the roof and dropped down on the other end. The other plausible explanation is that, I remember I described the 18650 cell or the cell as a firework. What could have happened was they ignited on one side, shot across 300 feet, ignited material on the other side. So now we're getting into what did we learn from this? Well, we learned that common combustible packaging is a no-no, and all your batteries are allowed to be shipped in common combustible packaging. Inside of your MRF, what does, it, what does it come in, a box, a cardboard box? It's starting not to make sense, and now we're starting to make sense of it. To finish up what happened uh, on the scene, and, and I went back recently, and we're looking at a not beginning cleanup until the middle of next month. It's been almost a year. Here's some of the, the materials you can see that were, we, we still consider this unaffected because this was soot impregnated, that's all. There's soot on it. But it didn't burn. It didn't contribute to the fire in any real active way. So this was bypassed or jumped. So I'll let this video one for just a couple of seconds. And remember, we did this with a, with a drone. What we all also did was uh, took uh, some decent hydrofluoric, uh, well, hydrofluoric acid and gas family, HF, is what's really threatening to people because it's absor absorbed through your skin. And even from a firefighter's perspective, we're not protected from that because our skin is exposed at some point. We found that there were spikes early on but they dropped after a while. And that's where EPA was really, really concerned. What, what we, and I'll, I'll move through this, this video. What we ultimately did was we took a, we call this a stick. You'll see these on the back of fire trucks. 
please don't call it a fire engine. It's a fire truck. We extended the stick and we dropped water on it. Well, the EPA was concerned with water runoff. We don't know the toxic elements inside these burned batteries. So they ordered a six foot by six foot moat dug around the building to capture any water runoff because the uh, uh, LaSalle River was not too far off. So downstream, physically and otherwise, risks were real. Keeping in mind that the, uh, I think the chief, chief staff, the chief of the fire department there did regular briefings with the media. I'm surprised no one knew about this. Uh, did regular briefings with the national media every three hours for a week. You can see the river in the background. Uh, that's the river they were worried about. The smoke's blowing in an easterly direction. Um, this is again the, the last of the drone footage. You can see the white has turned from gray to, to uh, um, smoke has turned from gray to white, meaning we have a, some semblance of control over the fire. But that's not the big issue. The big issue is this was a non-insured player. This was a small operation. This was between 100 and 200 tons of battery, brand new commodities. All of those kind of add up to this is a problem. Now, I don't want to be the lithium ion naysayer. I am asked all the time, you're the guy, lithium ion guy. Would you put your children in an electric vehicle? Well, the answer without hesitation is absolutely, without question. We're even getting some indications that have, you know, the, when we get to the point where the number of internal combustion engines, gasoline, et cetera, are commensurate or the same as the amount of EVs on the road, we still expect EVs to be safer. The risk really comes with now these batteries have been used and abused. We don't know what, is, what they've been what put through, what paces thrown around, dropped, run through with forklifts. We don't know what state of health they're in. But when they wind up in your MRF or your recycling environment, you can expect they're in the worst possible state of health. So the opportunity for failure has increased dramatically. That's why I'm surprised. And I know you're real conservative with those numbers. But I'm surprised that we're not into the teens to the early 20s. I, the 6X is just, that's because it goes unreported. The only way we're going to report is the Felicity Ace ship that I showed you. They have no choice but to report because everyone knows about it, right? This is the, uh, when we did some infrared, um, I won't bore you with another fly through, but we, we tasked the drone to look for hot spots or burning batteries. We saw hot spots upwards of six weeks later, so batteries will continue to burn. We weren't going to send firefighters in there because we didn't know the toxic gas profile. We didn't know what we were exposing them to. So we had to be very careful. Uh, in, in retrospect, what the firefighters did, the city of Morris and LaSalle was brilliant. They worked with nothing. They didn't know what they were getting themselves into. Last year, there was a, an explosion in Calhoun County, anybody from Georgia? Calhoun County, Georgia, where firefighters were hurt when an ISO container containing lithium ion batteries exploded as they approached it. And this is happening way too frequently. Uh, very quickly, just to show you that battery is a battery is a battery to a certain degree, this is a fire that took place two weeks after the Morris fire. Two weeks. The chief from Morris, while uh, I was responding, I could hear the sirens in the background, said, Ron, you're not going to believe this. I'm on my way to LaSalle, which is about 25 miles uh, uh, west of Morris, we have a fire in an energy storage container outside of Braitwood Nuclear Facility. And they called him because he just two weeks ago became the only chief in the country basically that had experience with dealing with these things. So just two weeks and it happened. And these are all brand new batteries. So if they can happen with brand new batteries, they'll happen with used batteries in a MRF, for example. Um, you know, the, ups, the positives and negatives of the firefighter response. Some of the fire codes will change for you. Uh, in the 2024 International Fire Code, they already addressed your concerns. 
So I would absolutely become familiar with the International Fire Code, which is the dominant fire code in the United States. If not, NFPA has Fire Code 1, which hasn't even addressed batteries yet. Um, I'm curious about the insurance underwriting issues. Uh, I heard uh, a, a person represents one of the largest insurance in the, in the world the other day tell me they're getting to the point where they're not going to underwrite lithium ion or battery facing activities. So does that mean electric vehicle production, logistics, recycling? They just think it's too expensive, too risky. Um, the authorities have in jurisdiction, the insurance underwriters, the fire marshals, they're getting more, uh, they're getting clearer on the code language and what they should be doing about these issues. So you need to find a way to interact with them on a, on a regular basis so they understand what you do. And they can understand specifically from this perspective. When the fire service responds to your facility, the first thing they're going to do is ask a lot of questions. We think of firefighters as these people that are going and do whatever, whenever. That's not always the case. They have families too. They want to get home. So they're going to ask you, what's in this facility? What's burning? And what happens while you're answering all those questions? Your facility is burning to the ground. So walk through these things, we call them walkthroughs, with your fire, local fire department beforehand. They probably don't know a lot about how to deal with it. They would appreciate buying pizza or something, I don't know. Um, some of the lessons learned very quickly. Um, the cleanup's not yet underway. We're learning what fire suppression does, how to use it, what suppressants work and what suppressants don't work. Um, water's always a good default, but we have to be careful about runoff. Definitely don't use it on lithium batteries. The problem is you're probably going to have a mixed bag. So do I use water or not becomes the question. Uh, flash code changes are in place and, and coming to term in California and Illinois, specifically because of Morris. Flash code changes means I'm not waiting till the 2024 code cycle begins. I'm adopting these tomorrow. What does that mean for you is a question you might want to ask. Um, so there's a couple of, of, of committees that work on some of these issues. Some of our research partners, we've been funded by the US DOT. It's a little bit about our company to build specialized battery transport and containment systems. We've gone through SBIR phase one and phase two with great success. Uh, we partnered with the University of Michigan, Go Blue, and with the University of Texas at Austin, Hook'em Horns, and we do very good work with them, I believe. Uh, we're also an Underwriters Laboratories partner on test and training development, and an NFPA partner on training development solely. Um, containment and control. If you leave with nothing from me, uh, find a place to put your batteries if you can. But imagine that putting batteries in an enclosed environment just creates other hazards. So uh, just quickly, this is what we, do, we did for the, we call it the BLISS. So it's a battery logis logistics inter, uh, integrated safety system. We designed this for automotive in particular. So you can see we're moving automotive battery packs. Uh, DOT funded us to do this in two phases. Uh, DOD, Department of Defense, the U.S. Navy in particular, uh, might take this over for uh, um, additional phases. What we can do is contain batteries, monitor them at all times. We know when they fail. Uh, control toxic gases when they evolve, when they're burning, when the batteries are burning. Notify. So there's a chirp on the outside of the box and there's a, a strobe to let people know in your environment that there's a fire underway or a failure underway. It's not always a fire and then communicate that to an inter interested third party, just like Fire Rover does. Great technology, great approach. I want someone else to know. Get the fire department rolling, et cetera. The other thing that we've done uh, on the left-hand side is a, what we call a man carry box uh, for the United States Navy where we're moving batteries to and from theater inside a controlled environment. It has all the same features. Um, and the, and the uh, concluding slide is uh, some of the things we're doing, some of our partners, uh, both in development and build. Uh, we're very proud of our partnerships. We, can, we cannot uh, survive without partnerships. We are a small company with big hearts and big ideas. And we're able to take those big ideas to fruition because of our arrangement with the federal government and some of our academic partners. 
Um, some of the things that I think are important is collaboration, design of sustainable packaging. Where do you put your batteries? Do you need to be shown that? Uh, how to train your employees? We do that as well. And then engage with our partners to, uh, we get a really good look at what coming codes and standards look like. We call it seeing around corners. We can see around corners a bit. I know what the code for 2024 looks like in detail a year before everyone else does. Not because I'm some Jedi. Did you, did you know that Jedi are real? Yeah, I did. I you're one of them. No, no, no. You're, you're a guy who won't get, or you're safer in EV car, but no helicopters. No, I'm not getting it. Foot, foot first in the helicopter. You can skip that. Um, and then leadership. So we have developed a safety a center of excellence for battery safety, where we work with National Auto Dealers Association and others on preparing their employees for risk issues and providing them safe uh, storage for batteries. Um, any questions, or did you want to save it for uh, question and answer? Now, please. Uh, we, we're please. there. We're there. Yeah. Oh, ask a question. I can't wait to see all these hands go up. Yeah, yeah. Hang on for the mic. We got more questions than that. One question that I get a lot that hadn't been asked yet, but is uh, about fire rover specifically, is if I if I put it, install a fire rover system, am I going to get a discount? And the answer is yes and no. Your discount's going to be when your losses go down because of taking preemptive action such as that. So that's something I was going to share and I forgot at the time, but. It's, it's part of staying at the bottom of that industry curve. Well, yeah, and I can say just based on that, I mean, you know, I'm having a ton of different conversations. I mean, we're, we're being brought into France through an insurance, like one of the large reinsurers there. So, you know, it's one of those things. I mean, of course, from a, from a prescriptive perspective, they're going to look at you yourself, what it looks like. Do they want to be in the industry? Um, but, I mean, I do know there's, you know, little by little as we prove ourselves, it's uh, – you know, it's getting more and more um, prevalent to offer. I don't know if it's offering discounts per se, but I mean, it's definitely uh, putting our customers in a better shot uh, from a um, risk mitigation perspective. Absolutely. So yeah, I, I had a question. I'm wondering if with these OEMs, you know, as EV makers, you know, they're increasing energy density, trying to increase range on these vehicles. Has there been any consideration about integrating chemical agents into the battery packs to suppress fire at the cell level? before it gets bigger than that? It's a great question. So you're talking about impregnating uh, some, some uh, it's, it's a blend of active and passive, what we call active yeah. and passive fire suppression approaches. They've, they've, they've tried that. They've tried uh, looking into making uh, uh, different types of um, uh, internal materials, both liquid and otherwise, that are not, there's nothing that's fireproof Nothing. Don't let everybody, anybody ever tell you there's anything. Something that's fireproof. Nothing's fireproof. Um, but to my knowledge, there's, there's being research being done. Nothing that they've been successful in. There's a scale that I think is, is always, have to, always has to be considered. And I, I think that's a great question because it leads us into the, the promise of, st of solid state batteries. Uh, they'll tell you, read an article, new article, they're so far away from it becoming re reality. We're looking at a decade or more, if it is su it's successful. The other problem becomes that with solid state, you're basically transitioning from a lithium ion battery to a lithium battery. So now, the only thing that really changes is there, there's considerable, uh, you know, you diminish the risk. But when they fail, they will still fail catastrophically. Yeah. I, I, won't, I won't use a water-based fire suppressant in that case, because I'm not applying water to a, a, a combustible metal fire, class D. But the risk really, though the risk drops, the end of the, end of the day, the outcome stays the same. But to answer your question directly, they're working on those things, that's a stretch, because now you want them to reinvent their wheel. Yeah. They're just not gonna do it. Yeah, cool. thank you. Mm -hmm. You said that they are, they're not cleaning up yet? They haven't started? Oh, Ed Morris. No, yeah. they haven't. What's, nope. the, what's going to be the mitigation area? And I'm thinking about the, the smoke, the plume, you know, beyond the building. Uh, I, I confess I'm a nerd, and we don't have time for me to really dig into the nerd stuff. But what I will say is this. Um, we've done toxicology studies that show that for most intents and purposes, Aside from the HF gas I mentioned, which is an acute 
right now issue, aside from the HSF gas generation or acid, depending on whether you've applied water to it, burning batteries are, tend to be innocuous from a water runoff perspective, meaning that if I have an electric vehicle burning in the middle of the road, I use water to, to knock out the fire and it runs into uh, a local um, you know, collection and cleanup system. That system should be able to do the trick. So I'm not expecting downstream, not physically, but downstream issues of high magnitude. Now that does not mean to say that there are some, not some toxicology issues. There was a fire in, in a Rivian plant. Here I go again, throwing companies under the bus. There's a fire in a Rivian plant uh, in Southern Illinois, their second one in two months, uh, about three weeks ago. Car hoisted above for battery installation and it decides to burn. There's no hook or crook to it. So the fire department comes in, I knock out that fire, and am I done? That becomes the question. And it depends on who you're asking. If you're asking EPA, EPA is telling you, no way are you done. I have toxicology studies. I have people to protect. I have communities to protect. We've got to look into this thing. And that's where you guys, like, dragging you guys back into it. It's, you know, the small fire thing, yeah, they're physically small. But they always grow into something bigger, unless you have a system to control it. So we do the same thing with those, those types of toxicology studies, developing out the long-term risk issues. We just don't know. But for most intents and purposes, you can flush it down a sewer. And if you come from a large municipal water cleaning system, it should be able to handle it. I can't wait to see the next All right, last question. Well, thank you. Um, I'm curious. Um, you know, the topic of, of hot loads is very scary. And maybe this is a, a question more for, for Ryan. Um, but are there, do, do you anticipate advances um, on intercepting and minimizing the, um, the hot load issue? Like, will, does, does Fire Rover have plans for mini rovers on the collection of fleet. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're dealing with, I mean, the, the, the problem that you're dealing with is the same thing Ron's dealing with, right? I mean, I, I can keep, I have to have 100% connectivity, right? So the minute that it's in a car somewhere, that you're not gonna have 100% connectivity. So that's really the big issue. I think you're, you're seeing Duluth systems that are being created for the hot loads, right? Where, you know, they can basically, I mean, I'll use Ron's term, impregnate, right? But I mean, basically impregnate the load. Um, we have a ton that fall onto our tip floors, right? And again, we actually ask them to. So, uh, you know, there's another municipality in Ohio that, you know, when there's fires, they'll act as triage, right? Like they, they basically say, bring your fires to us, we'll put them out for you, um, which is something that in theory we can do, but it's also dangerous, right? Now, do you want to drop it in the middle of a street or do you want to drop it in a controlled environment where we think we can actually do something? Um, and, you know, some of our customers have gone down that path. Um, you know, again, from an innovation perspective, I think there's always innovation, right? I mean, it's, you know, so I would, I would hope that they could figure out a way to basically fill up the, uh, to, you know, to fill up the, the trucks and their loads, right, before they get to us. But for, you know, one of the things we do, we do a lot of fleet protection where, you know, so if you have your trucks that are half full during, at night and they put them into a row, we can do thermal trending on those and at least catch that first one. And one of the things that's really important, and everybody talks about these AI systems, but really like FM has classified us as the first smart monitor. And the reason I say this is that, you know, it's really not about catching that one fire. It's about catching that fire before you have the domino effect or the chain effect. So if I can catch a heat abnormality on a truck, then guess what? I just saved 12 other trucks, which is, you know, 350,000 a piece. And, you know, you just saved, you know, 5 million bucks worth of equipment. It's the same thing with lithium ion batteries. You know, from an AI perspective, a lot of co companies are out there in Europe, and this is why we're being brought into Europe, but like they're basically saying, hey, I can come in and I can spray that fire. Well, it's not about that, right? Because at the end of the day, it's not the fire that you're spraying. 
It's the fire you're spraying. It's the people that are trying to fight the fire that you don't want to hurt. It's the collateral assets that you have to spray. So what Ron was showing in our large lithium ion battery operations, we're actually not spraying the fire, right? We are, but we're also spraying that pallet that might be, um, you know, that might be cardboard. And it, if you have an ember that comes or it gets hot enough, it's going to start another domino. So we spray that domino. We spray a ton of buildings when it's an outdoor fire. So an ASR pile, I'm spraying the building. We have one rubber fire we put out. We spray the entire building. So really it's how do you create that ability for you to think and really, you know, and have human interaction during the firefighting process. And that's one of the things that there's no other systems out there that are doing it. And I would love to say that I'd put it on a truck because we've been asked on trucks, trains, boats, everything. <laughs> And it's just, it's one of those, besides the deluge side where it would just like expand, um, I, I really think that's probably the only technology that I, that I know of. I mean, I don't, I hope that answered your question. Okay, let's, uh, let's give Ron, David, and Ryan a great round of applause for a fantastic <laughs> session. We're on break. Uh, for the next half hour in the exhibit hall and uh, just a reminder that's going to be the last time that you're going to have uh, an opportunity to mingle with the exhibitors. They'll be breaking down in about an hour. Recording stopped. Thanks, Ray. If anybody wants, I have a few copies of these, so if anybody wants a copy, we'll stream the Thank you. Thanks, Pam. That was awesome. Yeah. Ron, good job. Well done. Dave, great job. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks a lot. Sure. Yeah, appreciate it.